endlessly trapped, essentially immobile. If you draw lines, they'll cut you. Perpendicular lines stab. Parallel lines tear. You apart. If you move, there is no escape. Not from the body politic. Not from the body. He's, uh, he's absent today. Um, what can I help you with? I was hoping to ask him some questions. Let's see if I can help. Why don't you grab a chair and sit down? Uh, hi, I'm Mara. Alec. Alec, nice yeah. to meet you. Nice this is my too. friend Charlie. Hey, hey, Charlie. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, so you study political philosophy too? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that's, that's what I do here uh, as a grad worker. So, um, yeah, so the professor obviously is a professor of political philosophy, but that's also what I do and what grad students do. In fact, I'm, I'm grading your papers right now, so. What's it like studying that in today's political climate? Uh, very fascinating um, for many different reasons. Um, I mean, obviously, just with the way that American politics are now, it's incredibly important to be talking about these ideas, but also, I don't know, students seem to really eat this stuff up and for really important reasons. That's really helpful to hear. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think people are sick of just living in a world that tells them how to live. And college is this moment where you have an opportunity to finally reach out and do something with the world that you've just sort of been this passive by. So I think that's why it's so important to be talking about this kind of stuff, because students want to make a difference. They care about issues of social justice. They care about economic issues and political issues. And we need to make sure that that sort of idealism that students come in with, that young people come in with, doesn't get taken away from them because there's something so important in that. And I think oftentimes education systems really strip that out of people. And at least I see my role and the role of philosophy generally, if it did its job better, is to galvanize the students, to make them more interested, to, I don't know, set them into a world where they can make a difference. So what does progress look like to you or how do you see it happening now? Um, so I think one of the biggest ways that we can spark progress is, first of all, teaching students how to think critically, right? It seems sort of like a, a catch-all phrase and a very common phrase, but it's really important to get to that point where we can think critically about the systems around us. So we can see how all of these systems have these underlying assumptions at, at the base of all of them, right? Um, sort of beginning with different ethical positions or, you know, end with different ideas in mind. And so I think it's really important that we talk about these kinds of ideas because the moment that you're equipped with the ability to critique and break down economic and political structures, all of a sudden people say, Things don't have to be the way that they are right now, right? We can actually change things. And so the moment that you recognize that all of human history is just this conglomeration of people making decisions for various reasons, you can see how those structures have emerged and how you could potentially be a part in changing those structures. And I think a lot of people don't recognize that. A lot of, a lot of students and a lot of people in the world generally see things as they are and assume that's how they've always been. What sort of ways do you see a sort of general story about progress evolving? It's interesting. Um, so I think there's these sort of these grand narratives that all throughout human history, but almost in a way we're reading into it, we're, we're laying that veneer over the course of history, and maybe that wasn't the way that it actually developed. And I think history and narratives are actually a lot messier than we think they are, right? So,
trying to demonstrate that it's these material conditions, these economic concerns fundamentally that push history forward. Um, and I don't think somebody like Marx was naive enough to think that that's all that there has been. Um, even if that's sort of like the dominant narrative, it's certainly the case that all sorts of ideas and differing ideologies have, have pushed society forward. But I think especially right now, as I was saying in sort of this post-2008 society, that economic narrative is real, right? And so there's like this, there's this, this idealism almost in the face of absolute pessimism, right? Climate change, student loan debt, high rent, all of these economic factors and social and ecological factors are adding up to a situation where you have this groundswell of activists and students who want to go out and change the world. And so I, for one, would say, hey, let's ride this narrative. Let's try and change things. And I think the only way that we get there is we can ride all the letters and critiques and everything that we want. But unless we're actually out there on the streets, unless we can have things like strikes across the nation where we withhold our labor and we say to these politicians and to the administrators that we're not going to take it anymore, that we're doing the work of the future and we need to be paid accordingly, that's the only way that we're gonna get changed. That really ties into the disruption of the overarching economic narrative that you were talking about. And I think it's a good way to, to, to recognize not only do we have to disrupt, right? It's almost sometimes it's too easy to just disrupt. Mm -hmm. We need to disrupt, but we also need to create. And that's why I think it's so important to have these alternatives, right? Because we can talk about destruction all we want. We can talk about how we want to burn it down. But unless there's something there on the other side, nobody's going to want to join in that, right? And so that's why I think it's so important to have this sort of radical experimentation. In America and across the world, in most developed nations, we value democracy. Or at least we pretend. <laughs> to value democracy, right? But the only way that we have political democracy is if we realize that the place that we're in for eight hours every single day, five days a week, for our entire lives, unless we realize that that's fundamentally anti-democratic and we change that and try and make more democratic structures in those places of our lives, we're never gonna have real democracy. So it's this sort of it's this sort of veil that's been placed over us where we pretend like democracy is just walking into a ballot box every four years mm -hmm. rather than every single day of our lives engaging in democracy. So all of these decisions, these things that people don't think about ever, right, because it's just the way things are, there are alternatives and it means democracy. And it means taking on responsibility, not just for yourselves, but for your community. What sort of obstacles do you see within the left in terms of the progress that we need to accomplish? So there's still, there still is a sort of liberal, even neoliberal tendency um, that somebody like Francis Fukuyama laid out um, a couple decades ago, this idea that we've reached the end of history, right? That we've sort of, this is the last narrative. Oh yeah, well he's still around. He is still around. And that's what's so interesting is, this is where we get this idea of competing narratives, right? So the collapse happens in 2008, yet these narratives still exist. It's not like they just went away. In fact, in many ways, they just strengthened themselves, right? So the collapse happens in 2008 and we bail out the banks, right? And economic inequality is even greater than it was pre-crash. So actually the wealthy have benefited more post-collapse than they did before the collapse. 
And so that's where you see this strength of competing narratives and how actually maybe this idea of the end of history is still a dominant narrative that still continues to exist in a certain way. That neoliberal politics still might be in a position of power. And so I think this through line is a recognition that there is a competing narrative here that not only exists but needs to gain steam. It, it sounds like you think a lot of the, the competing narratives and conflict comes from this economic disparity. Exactly. And that's, that's fundamentally why this economic narrative has sort of reemerged. Because not only do we see the stark levels of inequality, I mentioned before the fact that Jeff Bezos has $150 billion worth of wealth while people are struggling to survive. And we wonder why we want to see some sort of competing narrative to the one that we've been sold. Do you think that there is strength in competing narratives, or do you think that that is what will tear us apart? I am not going to accept that question and instead say, <laughs> I don't... I don't think there is strength in competing narratives because clearly we want one to win out over the other. Um, I don't think we have a choice. I don't think we have much of a choice, especially given climate change and the levels of inequality that we see. And that's why this idea of destruction, sure, but creation is a necessary component, right? So. I don't see anything fundamentally important about competing narratives in themselves. Mm -hmm. We want to have something that actually wins. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't think I phrased that question very well because I'm not getting the answer that I was looking for. I'm hearing you talk a lot about um, how competing narratives definitely exist within the left and they're unavoidable and, and they're part of progress, but I'm not hearing anything about what we can do to fight back against that. Yeah. No, I, you're right. Um, so I think what's actually really important to realize, or at least I think this is the case, I think most people are actually on board with this narrative. Most people, not just on the left, most people in general, I think are on board with this type of narrative. That something's fundamentally wrong with the economic structures around us, that we need to change them, we need to have alternatives. And so I think our role is A, exposing that and pointing that out, saying, look at all of these examples of the people who are in positions of power. Look how they're intentionally ostracizing this other narrative that so many people across the political spectrum believe in. And then also going out into the streets and creating these alternative mechanisms. I think that's fundamentally important. So I've talked to you about this idea of radical experimentation. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Get involved with the labor union, right? If you work at a workplace and you're not being treated fairly, you don't have a $15 minimum wage, you're not able to meet the basic living standards of a city like Chicago, unionize, right? Show these workplaces, these people that make, you know, multi-million dollars, every single year, that you want to have some sort of democratic say in what you do in your daily life and what you do with the profits of the things that you participate in every single day. Go out there and start a worker cooperative, right? That's hard to do, but there are, there are funding organizations out there that will fund worker cooperatives. Go out there and try and start a housing cooperative, right? Be involved in your communities political engagements, right? Try and start uh, different community funds, working with homeless people, trying to right some of the wrongs that exist in your society. Start at the local level and say, hey, what can I do today, here and now, to be efficacious that, that we can make a change? In That's not even the end of the list. There are so many others that haven't even been thought of yet that we can figure out ways. How do we democratized, but imagine as they're doing in places like Brooklyn, where you have an entire housing cooperative that has built on top of their buildings solar panels that then they put on a distributed network so that they harness the power of the sun 
They can give it to everybody in the building, essentially free of charge, other than the cost of repair. So there's the all these different ways. If somebody has excess energy, energy, how do we take and then this trade it to your neighbors and distance or sell it at a cheaper price? That is fundamentally hierarchical, where the people at the top don't care about the daily lives of the people at the bottom. How do there's all sorts of other now? structures. I mean, start to build there's a horizontal structure. Public investment bank that's um, trying to be passed in Los Angeles right now, where it's taxpayer money, and individuals can go to this investment bank and borrow money to be able to actually create businesses in that community. These are all types of structures that, at the core, they're democratic. Where are you? Have you changed your mind? We haven't made a decision yet. Some things just shouldn't be handled lightly. So, I understand if you're waiting for yes or no, but it will take some time. 